Hey General Psych students, so this week we are finishing up our discussion of social psychology and we are moving uh, into discussing uh, psychological disorders and finishing up this semester really strong. So I think you're going to find uh, this very last section of social psychology to probably be one of the more interesting uh, findings um, and some of the more interesting ideas that we have talked about. So uh, previously we were talking about social influence, the role that other people around us play and the role that we play in influencing others or being influenced by others. And so uh, last week we talked about conformity, this week um, and we also talked a bit about different compliance techniques like the door in the face and lowballing. And we're gonna finish with our discussion of obedience to authority. So compliance is a little bit different. Earl is saying hello. It's kind of chilly out today, so um, we're kind of snuggling up here. Um, so compliance is basically doing what somebody tells you to uh, because they asked you to. This person doesn't necessarily have to be an authority. They could be a subordinate. They could be uh, kind of in a lateral position, or they could be an authority figure. But obedience by and large is not being asked to do something. It is specifically being ordered to do something by somebody in power. Um, so this was largely done through the work of Stanley Milgram. Milgram, uh, whose image you see here. Um, and so Milgram was kind of interested in terms of how the environment around us shapes the situation that we are in. And part of the reason that he was interested in this work, as were many social psychologists, were due to the fact that World War II had only ended about maybe 15 years immediately prior. And as time went on over those 15 years, more and more information came out about the atrocities that were committed against uh, the Jewish people and many, many other groups of people by the Nazi regime. And so one of the things that you would occasionally hear um, about these kind of atrocities was, well, these people are just sick in their souls. They are evil people, and that's why they did these terrible things. Milgram wasn't necessarily so sure. Milgram believed that the power of the environment had a very sizable role in shaping behavior. So what would you do if you were in a situation where you were asked to hurt another human being? And most of us would say, well, I would never do that. And Milgram and a lot of the work that he did ended up really demonstrating that as much as we like to believe that, we are very, very powerfully shaped by the env environment around us. And so we're gonna spend some time talking about Milgram's obedience research. So I want you to imagine in his landmark study from 1962, um, I want you to imagine that you have basically been brought into a laboratory at Yale University. So already, I mean, come on, it's Yale. Um, if I were going to Yale, I would be intimidated. And, you know, I have a PhD. I am technically on the same level as many of these people, but come on. It's Yale, it's really prestigious. So even somebody with a PhD like me would be incredibly intimidated. Um, so you go into Yale University and you basically meet an experimenter in a white lab coat. And you meet another person there who is there for the experiment. And you're basically told that you're doing this experiment to examine the effects of operant conditioning or punishment on memory performance. Now, that's not what the study is actually about. It's a really clever cover story for what you're supposed to be doing. And so the idea behind this memory experiment is that you're going to learn, somebody is going to learn lists of word pairs. And basically every time that a person uh, makes a mistake on uh, one of those word pairs, they're going to get shocked. So there are two critical roles that have to be played in this experiment. We have a teacher, the person who is going to teach somebody lists of word pairs and is going to provide punishment when the other person fails, and the person who is supposed to remember the items, the learner. 
And so the experimenter gives you and this other person um, basically slips of paper to draw. And what a surprise, you are the teacher and the other person is the learner. Now let's be really clear. This entire drawing is rigged. The participant is always the teacher. The, partic the true participant is always the teacher. Uh, the man who is being selected as the learner is a confederate. He is part of the experiment. He is working with Milgram. And it's always set up that he will be the learner and the true participant will always be the teacher. So they put um, the they put the learner in another room and they basically set him up um, with wiring so that whenever he makes a mistake, he gets shocked. And to kind of help you believe this, they deliver a little bit of a shock to show you what it's going to feel like for them. Uh, the experimenter asks the learner if there are any questions and the man, uh, the learner basically says, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I found out I have a heart condition. Is receiving these shocks going to be a problem for me? And the experimenter says, you know, they might be uncomfortable, but they're not dangerous. You're probably going to be fine. And so you and the experimenter leave the room. Now, remember that our learner is basically um, is basically an actor. They're a part of the experiment. They are working with Milgram. So once you leave, uh, the learner basically sets up a tape recorder um, it turns out he's not actually connected to these wires. He sets up a tape recorder in this room uh, that is basically designed to make certain auditory responses when you give him a shock. So you go back into the other room. The experimenter basically sits at a desk and you sit in front of this shock machine, which is really impressive. Um, and you can kind of see that... Um, that there are all these different switches. And so basically how it kind of works is that every time the learner makes a mistake, uh, you start with the 15 volt switch. The next time that the learner makes a mistake, you up the voltage to 30. So you're always increasing by 15 volts every time the learner makes a mistake. And at least initially, the learner's not really making mistakes, but then all of a sudden he does. And so you're going to have to flip that 15 volt switch. So you'll kind of notice here that on our list of shock levels, it goes all the way up to 450. And the shock levels on this shock generator have labels. So we have slight, moderate, strong, very strong, intense, extreme intensity, danger severe, and the ever ominous triple X. So, so far, everything's going okay. Now, obviously, when you flip that switch, you are going to hear an auditory response from the learner via that tape recorder uh, that you'll hear, oh, like little grunts. It's going to hurt. But basically, by the time that you get to moderate shock, about 120, uh, the learner basically starts saying that, hey, this is really starting to hurt. I don't want to do this. Um, and additionally, he starts complaining about issues with his heart. He said, I told you that my heart was starting to bother me. It's still bothering me now. Let me out. Let me out. I don't want to do this. Um, and so as these shocks go up, the tape uh, that's basically tied to the shock generator, every time that you increase, you're going to basically hear him scream in pain. By the time that you get to extreme intensity and 330 volts, the man stops screaming. So at this point, you, the learner, or you, the teacher, are going to probably start getting very worried that you might have fatally injured this man. And at different points of the experiment, you're probably feeling really uncomfortable. This man is in pain. You are hurting him. And so what do you do? You go and turn to the experimenter and the experimenter keeps telling you it's essential that you must continue. You absolutely must continue. You have no choice. Please continue. So the experimenter is going to tell you to keep going and that you don't really have a lot of choice. And so my question for you is, if you found yourself in that situation, how far do you think you would go? I mean, it's a really good question. How far do you think you would go? And Milgram himself was interested in this question. You know, how far do you think people are going to go? And most people, when you ask them, you know, when are you going to stop? 
are you going to stop? Um, they say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop as soon as that uh, learner screams out in pain. And most people believe that if you were continuing all the way to these upper levels, that that must have meant you were a sadist, that you were sick in your soul. Um, and so 40 psychologists were asked about this and they basically said, yeah, most people aren't going to go all the way to the end. If they did, they would be a very, very sick individual. So when Milgram got his data, he was actually very, very amazed because 66% of people, about two thirds of all participants continue all the way to 450 volts possibly believing that they have injured this person. And of course, Milgram told them after, uh, at the end of the experiment, of course, the man who was the learner comes out and of course they're thrilled that they didn't kill this man, that it was all an act. Um, and they feel like they learned something about themselves. But I think this is really important. Two thirds of all participants continue to the end. And you'll notice that nobody stops dropping out until about 75 volts. And for many people, that's too much already. So some of you might be wondering, and um, you might have some questions about this. So Milgram's original study was done with all men. So uh, the first time that I taught this here at Cotty, um, when I was teaching Gen Psych, uh, my very first semester, I had a student ask me, well, what about women? Women are more nurturing. Um, will they continue to carry it out? And first of all, I would bring up that the nurturing aspect is a bit of a stereotype. Um, not all of us are super nurturing, but women are often socialized to be a bit more soft hearted, a bit more nurturing. And here's my point. Milgram was interested in that too. He actually did a follow up study with women. And uh, I will tell you, women are absolutely no different from men. Uh, again, we get about the same percentages carrying all the way to the end. So what's going on here? Are these people actually very, very sick in their souls? Are we evil people? Are we, like Loki kind of mentioned in the adventures, do we crave to submit to people? Do we need to be subjugated? I think Milgram believed that it's not because we're evil people, but rather that the situation that we find ourselves in can be a really, really powerful influence. And there are a lot of aspects related to authority figures that will, um, make you more or less likely to obey. So let's talk about some of those things. So Milgram was kind of floored by this experiment. This was an experiment that nobody would have predicted. And I would also mention uh, today when you do these studies, uh, people have tried to replicate Milgram's findings. They don't go all the way to 450 because, well, that's unethical. And also the deception levels here are just massive. He really couldn't have gotten these results any other way, but the deception is a big ethical issue. Um, most studies that try to replicate Milgram maybe only go up to about 135, maybe 150, you still tend to get the same results. So Milgram was kind of floored by his findings. What is going on here? And he very strongly believed that it's the power of the environment that makes people more or less likely to obey. So here's your baseline rate for males, uh, the original Milgram studies. You can see that females tend to exhibit obedience at a similarly high rate. Um, so your book kind of talks about this quite a bit on page 320. Um, there are situations that really kind of set up why people will end up obeying. So let's think about it. So first of all, the person who is giving you the orders is like right there in the room with you. He's at a desk. And not to mention, he's wearing a lab coat. He looks really, really authoritative. Um, odds are pretty good if the experimenter were not nearby and uh, wore plain clothes or were just a random person and not somebody perceived to be a scientist, you would probably get less obedience. Um, additionally, the authority figure is basically being supported by a prestigious institution. Yale is intimidating. If you went to a plain old office building, you don't get the same findings. Um, additionally, notice that in our original setup, and I do kind of want to go back to this for a second, notice that our, in our original setup, the learner, you don't see him. You are not anywhere near him. And in that case, it kind of depersonalizes him. 
a bit. Um, one of the things that we do find is that you get a lot less compliance if you have to actually pick up the um, pick up the learner's hand and actually put it on a shock plate. You're going to get less compliance there because you actually have to physically see the learner and touch them to punish them. Um, so we don't get as much obedience there. But by separating them from each other and not being able to see them, um, it kind of depersonalizes that person. Um, additionally, um, there were no other people that were kind of modeling behavior. You're the only one there. We actually find that the situation where you get the smallest amount of obedience, so you get the greatest defiance of authority, is when two other people are with you and they say, I'm not gonna do this. So let's kind of go through these different conditions and kind of see how obedience changes as a result. So if we move from Yale to a plain old office building, um, obedience drops. If the person is not an experimenter wearing a lab coat, but just an ordinary person, we get a massive drop. It's part of the reason why when I run experiments, I've never worn a lab coat. First of all, I don't work with a lot of fluids or any biohazardous materials, so why would I wear a lab coat? But also, people need to exercise their right to quit an experiment at any given point. If I'm wearing a lab coat, that can be really intimidating, so I never do. Um, if the experimenter is in a remote location and is giving you directions over the telephone, you actually get less obedience there as well because if the experimenter can't see you, um, you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can lie on the phone and be like, oh, oh yeah, oh, oh, I'm shocking him now, he's in pain. Here's the other thing. If the experimenter is not in the room with you, the sole responsibility for this other person rests with you. So one of the things that researchers note when they look at the tapes of the Milgram experiments, and you can find these on YouTube, is that people often will look over at the experimenter when they're figuring out what they should do. They're kind of shifting their own personal responsibility onto that authority figure. You can say the classic line, I was only following orders. I, I'm not responsible, I was following orders. But if the experimenter is on the phone, I mean, he's not there. He can't see you and you're ultimately the one that has to make the choice and you can't fall back on the experimenter as, hey, he's the reason that I did it. I was following orders. He's not there. He can't see you and you can lie to him. Um, if the victim is in the same room as the participant, we see obedience drop. That depersonalization is starting to fade. If you actually have to touch the victim, it drops even more, but the small, but basically the thing that produces the least amount of obedience. People are a lot more likely to rebel against authority when they see other people doing it too. So these are some different things that influence obedience. Um, we also know that when we are in other with other groups of people, this can also affect behavior. So we can talk a little bit about social facilitation and social loafing. So social facilitation is basically the finding that when you have to do something in the presence of other people, you actually end up doing better on the task than if you were doing it alone. So we often talk about something like a home court advantage or a home field advantage. Uh, what we tend to find is that people playing sports tend to do a lot better when they are in an environment where they are surrounded by supportive fans. Uh, likewise, um, up until the pandemic, I was doing a lot of work in community theater. Um, and I can tell you, I have had some absolutely disastrous nights uh, of dress rehearsals, especially during tech week, where directors are just about to lose their mind. And then all of a sudden, when you put those people in front of an audience, everything gets so much better. So that's social facilitation. This is actually a very well-documented finding. Um, this was originally discovered uh, by Triplet uh, back um, a while ago who had kids playing a fishing game. And uh, we actually find that kids playing this fishing game actually did a much better job when they were in the presence of other people rather than doing this on their own. Um, now, something that kind of goes against this though is that when we are in the presence of other people, 
we do tend to exert less effort than if we were doing something on our own. Um, and this is what's known as social loafing. And for many of you, this is probably why you hate group work. So probably the reason that you hate group work is because um, inevitably when you're put in a group, um, there's always one person who slacks off on doing work and everybody else is doing the work too. Uh, nobody wants to feel like they are being played for a sucker, so everybody as a whole ends up exerting less effort. But even without group work, this is something that we can see. So people were given headphones and they were basically made to believe that a certain number of people were either clapping or cheering. And these people, while they were wearing the headphones, were also told to clap and cheer. And researchers ended up measuring the volume of the noises that they made. And what they ended up finding, as you can kind of see here, people cheer and clap more loudly when they're the only ones. But as the group size increases, they cheer less loudly and they clap less loudly too. So we tend to exert less effort um, in a group than we do when we're alone. Now, I want you to think about something. Um, if you could be invisible for 24 hours, what would you do? I would play pranks, good pranks, uh, to borrow from the office guten pranken. Um, but think about the kind of things that you would do. Would you do anything illegal? Would you hurt anybody? Um, would you steal? What would you do? One of the things that we actually find is that when we feel like we are not invisible per se, most of us do not have Harry Potter style invisibility cloaks, but one of the things that we find is that when we're in the presence of a large group, um, there becomes a loss of self-awareness and self-restraint. Self when we're in these big group situations, particularly if arousal and anonymity are really high, we're more apt to do things um, that we otherwise would not do because we feel like we're not seen. So it's part of the reason why sometimes you will see people loot uh, and riot. Um, and that's partially because, first of all, you're in a large group of people, arousal is really, really high, and so what ends up happening is you're like, oh, they're not going to catch me, um, so I can do things that I otherwise would not do. It's also part of the reason why people will say terrible things on the internet that they would never, ever say in real life. Now, I say that, and yet Facebook, which requires you to use your name to be able to be on it. Um, people say horrible things on Facebook, but compare what people say on Facebook to a place like Reddit or 8chan or 4chan. Um, and what we're typically going to find is that the more anonymous a place is, the more some of those ideas become incredibly hateful. And that's because anonymity gives us a cover to say things that we would not otherwise say. And this is what's known as de-individuation. So um, one of the things that we will find that can kind of counteract that is making people aware of themselves. So researchers have actually done this with kids and Halloween candy. Um, they also do this to kind of discourage people from shoplifting. Um, one of the ways that they try to do this is have mirrors. So one of the things about human beings that's kind of interesting is that we have a tendency to look at ourselves when we're in the mirror. Um, and if there's a mirror around, we're going to look at ourselves in it. And that actually highlights self-awareness and gives you kind of your sense of self back, making you aware of yourself makes you less likely to fall prey to de-individuation. So if you put a mirror up when kids are basically encouraged to take as much Halloween candy as they want, they won't try to take the whole bowl because they've just been reminded, hey, you're a person, not invisible. And shoplifters will actually be less likely to shoplift if mirrors are present because they realize, hey, you're a person, um, you should probably not do this.
So let's finish up this section by talking a little bit about the effects of group interactions. One of the things that we find, and I would argue is something that we really need to be thinking about in the future, is that we have a tendency to form bubbles. Uh, we tend to surround ourselves with people who think like us, with people who see the world like us, and with people who share our values. And there is not necessarily anything wrong with that per se. You want to feel like other people understand your point of view. But one of the things that we know is that in general, when you're in those kind of bubble situations and you're talking about ideas, or your attitudes. Generally, when you are around other people who are like you, and you're talking about an idea, um, what ends up happening is that your attitudes end up being strengthened as a result. So this is what's called group polarization. The more time that you spend around people who think like you do, um, the greater the likelihood that you're going to become more polarized and there's going to be this huge loss of middle ground. Um, so if you want, if you want to learn more about people who are different from you, and I would argue we should make an effort to understand each other. Now, am I telling you that all ideas are equal and valid? So, most are, some are not. <laughs> if we're talking about denying somebody their humanity, um, that's an idea that I necessar would not necessarily get down with. But by and large, there are a lot of different ideas out there and not everybody shares the same point of view. And I think it's important, especially in times like these, when we are more divisive and you may not necessarily agree with me, that we need to make an effort to try to understand people who may not think like us. Um, and so what we tend to find is that with this group polarization, we get more extreme ideas and we start to kind of lose that middle ground. So it's important to expose yourself to ideas that you may not necessarily agree with. And I'm not telling you, you have to agree with those, but it's important to know that other ideas exist besides the ones that you specifically agree with. And I think this is something that we as a culture need to start talking about more because I find we are getting more and more polarized over time. And I don't necessarily think that it's going to be made better by continuing to retreat into those bubbles. So here's kind of an example of how group polarization can kind of happen. So we have these two different groups. We have a group that is high in prejudice. We have another group that is low in prejudice. And so when these people are asked to talk with other people who are like them, so people who are high in prejudice are going to talk with other people who are high in prejudice. People who are low in prejudice will talk with other people who are low in prejudice. What we tend to find is that after that discussion with like-minded group members, we find that the high prejudice group becomes even higher in prejudice and the low prejudice group becomes even more low in prejudice. And the middle ground is starting to fade further and further from view. So, um, and, and, and I kind of think this is an interesting paragraph from David Meyer uh, from uh, page 325, if you don't mind me reading it. The internet provides an easily accessible medium for group polarization. I got my start in social psychology with experiments on group polarization. Never then did I imagine the potential dangers or the creative possibilities of polarization in virtual groups. And there is actually a section on the next page about the internet basically functioning as a social amplifier and being a potential mode of group polarization.